thank you for joining us for, for this live webinar today, where we're going to talk about predicting the medals table at the Olympics. So the, the session today is to use a sporting reference, a game of two halves. We're going to talk uh, about the RSS prediction competition for this year, which involves predicting the medals table for the Paris Olympics. And then related to that, we're going to hear from uh, an expert in the field who's going to tell us all about how to rank nations at the Summer Olympics. So before we get on to that then, just a little word about the prediction competition this year, which is sponsored by Emelco. So this year, the goal of the competition is to predict the medals table for the Paris Olympics. Right? That's how the BBC would represent the medals table. That is number of golds followed by number of silvers and so on, not the total medals won, as you can see, because because Great Britain would be a little bit, well, no, not higher, because the ROC would overtake us. Uh, so that's the goal, to predict the medals table for the Paris Olympics. You can use any data you wish, as long as it's publicly available. And your job is to rank the 206 nations that are competing in the Olympics this year uh, in the submission template. So you'll See, the submission template looks like this. You've got all you have to do is alter that third think that country will end up in the medals table. The deadline in, um, now my co-organizer Ben's line is Monday the 22nd of July, but uh, we want a little bit bit of time to make. Make sure everything's working with this because it's it's quite a, a cumbersome line. It's Monday the 22nd of July because that's when we get before the opening ceremony in before Monday. So that gives you a week, which doesn't sound long, but that's sort of the point of the competition. We don't want you to spend too long on this. You'll see later on there's three prizes, two of which are to do with the methodology that you use to make your predictions so if you want to be content i've just shown you please give us a brief description of how you've come about and made if those predictions are a little bit like we're going to see today like i said you can update your predictions at any point before, uh, but it's the most recent one that we'll use as your as your final submission there's three prizes available. And I'll tell you a little bit about that next. Okay. Brilliant. I've already had a question come in, and that's perfect because I'm going to answer that on the on the next slide. So thank you. Um, so as I say, we've seen that submission template. So we've got three prizes available. So overall winner. Now, obviously. Right, the, the 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 prestige that comes with winning the RSS statistics in sport competition is is the thing we're all playing for here. So the person who gets that title, the overall winner, is the person with the best score. So um, how we're going to do that is very briefly to say the distance from the true ranking at the end of the games. But if you want to know more about that, then you can see the website, and I'll pop the link in the chat in a moment. Um, so we're going to basically look at your correlation between what you've put and what the final medals table is at the end of the games, and then the person with the highest correlation or the lowest distance between what they did and the final table is the winner. Um, as I say, there's a really nice description about the fantastic mathematics that underpins our, our scoring metric on the website, so have a look at that. Uh, this did cause a little bit of discussion about how to score this, and so maybe we'll talk about that later. Then we've got two prizes um, that are a bit more to do with the method that you've used to reach your ranking. So these are both chosen by the judging panel. They're informed by your correlation and 
your score, but principally it's about an interesting methodology that you've used to, to make those predictions. So one methodology prize and one student prize. And to be clear, to be eligible for the student prize, if you're a team, then at least one member has to have e-student membership of the RSS. If you're an individual, you have to have e-student membership of the RSS. Or if you're maybe too young for that, which we're hoping we might get some, some school pupils entering this competition this year, um, then that's fine, full-time education. And the prize is that the winners will be invited to present their work at the RSS conference this year. Um, and you get within that prize a uh, free day pass to the conference for the day that you're going to speak and your ex UK expenses paid as well. And um, all of this is thanks to the Royal Statistical Society and our sponsors, Amelco, for providing the day pass and the expenses. Right, so hopefully that gives you a flavor. As I say, I'll put the link to the website in the chat in a moment so you can go there for further details. There's also been a launch webinar that's currently on our uh, RSS YouTube channel. Again, there's a, a link to that YouTube video uh, on the website. So hopefully that answers all the questions that you might have. If you have got further questions, that's great. There'll be time at the end to ask competition organizers questions and our speaker questions. So I'm gonna hand over now to Johan, who's gonna tell us all about their work on uh, ranking countries for the Summer Olympics. So whenever you're ready, take it away, please. Yep, hold on. I can um, see your slides, but you're still now. muted. Brilliant. Hopefully, you got me now with volume. Okay, yeah. so um, I'll address the question to start with. Um, if my internet connection for any reason disappears, um, I will try and get back on as soon as possible. And also, for those who are expecting, a deep South accent from the University of South Carolina. I'm very sorry to disappoint you, but um, I'm fortunately a Yorkshireman. Um, so that being said, thank you very much for the introduction, um, Jess. Um, let's get cracking on this. This might take 40 minutes, it might take an hour, and if there are questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if Jess, you can moderate those, however you want to do it, whether that's at the end or whilst we're presenting, I'll leave that entirely up to you. Feel free to interrupt if needed, okay? So to start with, um, I am a bit of an imposter. Um, I'm an economist, I'm not a statistician. However, um, I use quantitative methodologies and statistics in answering economic questions. In particular, I am more of an applied econometrician rather than econometrician who's theory based. Therefore, I don't go around diving into asymptotics of estimators and so forth. I just use available methodologies to address what I feel are interesting questions. And most of those are related to sport. So in terms of the presentation, I'm going to aim to provide some background information about the Olympic Games, because the Olympic Games are in particular predicting what's going to happen at Olympic Games is very different to, say, predicting who's going to win the Grand National or who's going to win a tournament such as Euro 2024. The reason for that is because the Olympic Games are a multi-sport event, okay? Therefore, when you're looking to predict things, the determinants that might impact if you're going to win the 100-metre gold medal are going to be vastly different to whether you're going to win the gold medal in sailing. Now, I'll just leave you to where the literature is and where it isn't, and what I've done in the past. Typically, we aggregate all the events into one and see who's going to win the competition. In future, and this is where I'd hope it head, some people have done this for a select number of sports, but in my mind, if you want to see who actually is going to the Olympic Games, you may wish to model each individual event, the 100 meters, 
separately, the 1500 meters separately, the keering and the cycling separately, and all the individual events separately, and then see who the winners are, and then eventually aggregate who is going to end up top of the medal rankings at the Olympic Games. Okay. So in a multi sport event, it's very different to um, modeling, say, a grand national winner, although most of the time, most predictive studies look to aggregate things in one. And with the presentation, I'm going to aim to have it accessible. So I'm going to focus more on the sport management and sport economics route and find the key papers there. Most of you, I'm assuming, are statisticians. So hopefully, um, I'm going to accessibly bring the information from that literature to you guys to supplement your existing knowledge in order to hope that you can make better predictions. I'm also going to focus less on the actual modeling itself. Um, I'm going to be less quantity heavy. I do like empirical equations, but there aren't going to be any in this presentation myself. I'm hopefully just going to bring you some ideas and ideas of the inputs you may wish to put into your own models and let you decide what models you wish to apply to the prediction competition. Hopefully that should give also make it a little bit fairer rather than having people copying and doing the same thing. So it might allow that methodology prize to be a bit more iterative, more differentiation. And the overall objective of this presentation is to help you make potentially better predictions. Okay. So before I move any further, what I would like is, whether it's on a piece of paper, on your phone, or in your mind, my mind's very tired, so I definitely have to write things down, is to just write down who you think is going to top the medal rankings now. So without doing any kind of research, just put country on a piece of paper or on your phone. Don't worry, you'll be able to make revisions in future. But most importantly, what you have, please don't share it. I don't know if there's people watching a seminar, a webinar together or not. Please don't share it. Just make this as your own independent decision right now. And we'll see why I wanted you to do that. Okay. So once you have that on your piece of paper, let's move forward a little bit more in terms of presentation. So what do I do when I make my predictions or when I'm trying to make a decision on, say, who is going to top the Olympic Games, who's going to potentially finish second and third and so forth? I typically have or focus on three main things, okay? Not necessarily in this order. The one thing that I do definitely in order is I use my gut first, okay? So from the economics literature, this is what John Maynard Keynes called animal spirits. Okay, and animal spirits were um, involved investors making their decisions just based on gut feelings. Okay, so they invested in a firm or decided to increase capacity just because they felt it was the right time to do so, or maybe they withheld of an investment because they just perceived right now it's not the moment to make that decision. Okay, and gut decisions are typically non-rational or they can be non-rational decisions because they allow emotion to help cloud that decision making process okay now that's not necessarily a bad thing but what i want to make clear is that when you start building your statistical models for predictions or when you look at other analysts statistical models they potentially will have some of these emotive decisions within their own modeling okay so if you are trying to model, number one thing you, try, you should try and do is leave emotion out of your modeling choices if you can. It's very difficult. Your emotions can be quite good and gut feelings can be very helpful, however. So looking at Euro 2024, I predicted that France would lose in the final to England 2-1. I think I did quite well with my gut feelings um, because... Spain obviously were the winners yesterday, disappointingly for me. They knocked out France in the semi final, so I had a semi finalist. I also had a finalist in England, and I also had the correct scoreline. But when it came to making this decision, I was emotive in this decision. And I'll show you why. So, this was the reason why I chose that scoreline, or partly why I chose that scoreline. Because I, in my mind, says, we're going to win Euro 2024 and we're going to beat France 2-1 and it's going to be vengeance for the quarterfinal in Qatar 2022. That's how I came about that decision. 
Okay. So moving on in terms of emotions and some of the um, aspects that might cloud your judgment or cloud your gut feelings, um, I'm going to give you a brief primer into a few of these um, traits uh, from behavioral economics and behavioral finance that may influence your own decision making, your gut feelings, but also influence your statistical modeling. Okay. So the first aspect is herding behavior. And this is why I wanted you to write down your prediction to start off with without consulting anybody, just getting it before you look at anything whatsoever. And herding behavior is your individual decisions change based upon the decisions that you get from other individuals. So for example, you may have China on your piece of paper to say they're gonna to top the rankings in Paris 2024. And then you hear that everybody else says that France are going to top the rankings. You change your decision to be France, but purely based on the fact that other people have selected France. Now, there is a key distinction here about what you're doing. So herding behavior is where you will change your decision despite not receiving any new information and processing it, okay? So for example, you may have China as on your piece of paper, but then other people might say to you that France are gonna win the games because they have been secretly training at all the facilities for the past 18 months. And if that is new information, you may then use that information and say, okay, based on that information, I'm going to change my prediction to be France, or I'm gonna retain that prediction of China having this new information. In this instance, you are not herding. But had you had this information beforehand and knew that France were training in these venues for the past 18 months, and then you change your prediction from China to France, that would be evidence of herding behavior, okay? So that is one behavioral trait that might influence prediction. The second one is conservatism, where which can be linked to herding behavior as well, because even when you get new information provided, you are very stubborn with your predictions and you hold on to your prior beliefs. So you may have China on the top of your ranking list, and then new information is provided to you that half the Chinese um, Olympic Committee are being investigated for blood doping, and you ignore that information entirely and maintain your prediction. Conservatism is very typical in sport when it comes down to um, sentiment, in particular, um, emotional love of specific individuals. It's very common in Major League Baseball where you have a player who is entering free agency. Um, it could be a case that coaches get new information that their statistics are starting to decline or the player is starting to decline because of their age. Coaches maintain that player and sign him on for a new contract because of conservatism because he's performed very well the previous few years and they ignore this new information that the player may be tiring, he may be aging, he may not be performing as well based on history. Some other aspects include over or underconfidence. And this may impact your predictions, especially towards the middle of those countries who may be say 20th to 50th at the games, okay? And over and underconfidence is normally exhibited with financial decisions where you'll take on excessive risk if you're overconfident or less risk if you're underconfident. And this means that you pay too much or too little attention, depending whether you're over or underconfident, to the news provided to you. So for example, if I provided some news that the Chinese delegation are under investigation for doping and I'm very conservative or very underconfident, I might use, I may pay too much attention to that prediction and then may, maybe change my mind. If we had a mini prediction competition with the participants of this webinar, the best way to look at this is to ask you, and I won't do that rather than try and, um, I'll give you an example from my classroom, is that I normally ask my class, who here believes they are in the top half of the class in terms of their intelligence? So I ask the class, who here believes their intelligence is in the top half of the classroom? Given that I have a classroom of say 30 students, you'd expect to see 15 hands up because half the class would be above average intelligence 
and the other 15 will be below average intelligence. Typically in my classroom, I get two or three hands going up, which shows that most of my classes are underconfident. So in terms of your predictions, your over and your underconfidence you should pay attention how much information or how much weight you're placing on information based on your over and underconfidence. And finally, um, another key trait that may influence whether your prediction ability is your anchoring and how much you rely on the information provided. Okay. And typically, you may use redundant information for your predictions, and that's what you should try to avoid doing. Um, I'm just going to move on to the next slide and show you an image. So if we take a look at this image on the PowerPoint, we see there's Taylor Swift. She's promoting, she's a poster promoting her ERA's tour, which was hugely successful um, last, um, last year and still current, current, continuing. Okay. Now, based on this image and this image alone, I'm going to ask you a question. Or I'd make me to like you to maybe write down on your piece of paper or on your phone. Who is going to win the Super Bowl, the NFL Super Bowl in 2025? Who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl in 2025? Okay. Now I'm going to move off this screen, and hopefully you might have had something in your mind, or maybe have wrote down your piece of paper, the Kansas City Chiefs. Okay. Or one of the NFL teams you were thinking about in your mind were the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, what I've just shown you there is that you have anchored on redundant information, if that was the case. And the reason behind that was is that Taylor Swift, she's dating Travis Kelsey, who is a Kansas City player. That poster of Taylor Swift, even though there's a few degrees of separation to the Kansas City Chiefs, it gives you no information whatsoever about the probability that the Kansas City Chiefs or any other team in the NFL that, that will reach the Super Bowl final. So when you also receive information about predictions, it's key to try and remove redundant information. And there are other prejudices and unconscious biases that we have that we should try and omit before we engage in predictive activity or making statistical models. So whilst I've got bookmakers as my second term, it, what I typically do when I make my own predictions, I look at bookmakers or other predictions last, okay? And I use the term bookmakers vaguely. Better term to use here when it comes to prediction and what I do is look at other analysts, okay? Because other analysts typically will be using, will be researching information, they'll be May building their own statistical models, they'll be using their own data to make their own independent predictions of who is going to potentially top the medal table at the Olympic Games. Okay. And I noticed that Jess put something there publicly, publicly available information in your prediction competition. Now, the interesting thing here is, is this, this is where the informed versus the uninformed work. So the informed are those who possess superior information to those who are uninformed about a predictive decision. So for example, in financial markets, those who have superior information typically will make more revenue or more returns from trades than those who are uninformed because the, those who have superior information pick off or know what stocks or what assets to remove or to sell or to buy relative to those who have less information. In a sporting context, I'll provide this example. So back when I was 14, 15 years old, I knew who was going to be the next manager of a West Yorkshire football team because their son had joined our football club on the Wednesday, came training and told us that the deal has already been signed and sealed and delivered. The bookmakers had some information about who it could be, but the announcement wasn't made until Friday. So there were two days where I had superior information to the bookmakers. And in this instance, whilst the bookmakers had their own information, I could have taken advantage of that private information and picked off the bookmakers and made a lot of money. As it turns out, I didn't because I wasn't old enough to gamble. My mother wasn't sure enough to trust the mortgage on that specific sure bet. As it turns out, we were correct. I was correct. 
the child didn't lie about their father being appointed as the new ex-manager. But we can see there that the informed or the more information you have, typically you will outperform those with less information. Now, when it comes to other analysts or other bookmakers, their recommendations can be helpful in your predictions. And I use them as a guide. If I am way off the mark from the other analysts, it tells you one of two things. Either your model is vastly wrong, or if you're very confident, so this overconfidence axiom comes back, you are very right, or you're very correct. And if you trust yourself, you're the one who's going to benefit here. So focusing other analysts is always helpful to see what they predict. But as I mentioned beforehand, be wary of herding. Normally, what I do when I make my predictions is I'll have my gut feeling, I'll have my statistical model, then I'll look at what the bookmakers are doing. And if I'm close to that vicinity, I, I'm happy with my decision and I go ahead and proceed with my decision making. And the final thing is statistical models. So this is where I try and leave emotion at the door and try and build a statistical model. So statistics in sport uh, is growing. And we say thank you very much to the Moneyball revolution that has made statistics have a home in sport more than it did 20, 30 years ago. But one thing to mention is that statistics in sport is not equal. It was pioneered in Moneyball, which is baseball. So baseball is a very simple game with not many simultaneous actions going on at the same time. It's typically a pitcher throwing a ball at a batter or a hitter, and whether that hitter can then get on base or hit a home run or whatever. There are very rarely multiple actions going on at the same time. Maybe there's someone trying to steal a base, but very rarely it's limited interactions. So therefore, statistics is very good in that context. In other sports, such as professional football, it's much more difficult because you have numerous actions going at the same time. For example, if I'm going to have a shot on goal, the success of that shot will determine on about 21 other people who are around me, how much time and space I'm having closed down by a defender, whether my teammates are making off-the-ball movements, creating greater space for me, and that makes statistics more difficult. So when it comes down to predicting multi-sports events like the Olympic Games, statistics may be far easier um, or far more helpful in certain events, but more difficult in other events. So given that we've just used um, baseball and football in um, this idea, predicting the softball results or the baseball results in the Olympic Games may be more easier to do than it would be who's going to win the gold medal in football. Okay. And there's obviously a danger of over-relying on statistics. So one thing that I always think is that the traditional scouts are still have that use is because some things cannot be measured or it's difficult to measure certain inputs that are very important to get your output. But one thing can this be can be certain personality traits or temperament. It's very difficult to quantify temperament for numerous athletes. A scout can do that and we can use proxies, but some things cannot be accurately measured, which means that your outputs are only going to be as good as your input. So we should be wary of this error in our prediction. Okay. And I always find that with computational power increasing, machine learning and AI have got heavily involved in sports statistics. And in my specific defense, I think it's incredibly dangerous. So Nick Watanabe and I wrote a paper on this about the dangers of using statistics in sport because uh, speaking to some well, I'm going to mention there's two ways about this. There's one way where there's a website called StatBomb, which provides you lots of information in professional football. And there was a correlation which was very strong between progressive passes and assists in professional football. And suddenly, policy advice was we need to find players who pass the ball forwards because that is going to create more, more goal scoring opportunities and assists. When you broke that pattern down, and that pattern was found by machine learning, but when you broke that pattern down, the correlation was basically built on defenders. Now, defenders typically don't get assists. It's more attacking-based players who get assists. So the correlation between progressive passes and defenders was 0.6. When you broke that down to 
midfielders and strikers, the correlation was non-significant and only 0.1. So we can see the dangers of using too much AI and too much machine learning, but going back, we won't go too simplistic because a certain professional football club that's not to be named, they tried to replace Premier League striker who they'd sold and their method was to look at goals per game and just go through the list and say, this player is unaffordable, this player won't come to us and they went down the list until they found someone who was going to come, was affordable and had the highest goals per game ratio and that was a professional football club in the Premier League making their decision on such a simplified manner. So somewhere in between is where I believe statistical models should be used to help our decision-making processes. And the fair warning I'm going to use before I move on to more about the Olympic Games is that we're, we're only as good as the models that we build. Now, I've mentioned those biases that we had beforehand, those ones we have our gut feeling and our behavioural sentiments. They will be in our statistical models. I'm someone who believes that um, income is not as important to determine the success of sport Therefore, my models might not have um, income in those or place such a heavy weight on income in my statistical modelling as other people because I have witnessed a lot of people in sport having all the gear but no idea as a phrase. So I weigh income far less than other people might do and that's my own inherent bias. So moving on a little bit about Olympic Games and the literature from sport, economics and sport management about the inputs about what determines success. So the Olympic Games is a multi-sport event, okay? It has events, and an event is, say, the 100 metres, the 1500 metres, the long jump, the keyring in cycling, um, the triathlon is an event, uh, the cockless pairs in rowing, and these individual events are normally agglomerated within sports or disciplines. So the 100 metres, the 1500 metres, the long jump, they are agglomerated within the sport or the discipline of athletics. In cycling, we have multiple individual events, such as the road race. We have all the things that go on the velodrome. So all these individual events are grouped within cycling as a sport or a discipline. OK. Now, the events at the Olympic Games are dynamic. So they change. New events are added. Some events are removed. And one thing that you might want to pay attention to is that host nations can introduce new sports to the Olympics. So in Tokyo 2020 or 2021, whatever you want to call it, when they delayed due to COVID, Japan introduced karate and softball at the Olympic Games. Unsurprisingly, Japan did very well in those sports. And you're going to lobby for new sports where the home nation is going to have some success. Now, the number of events, sports and disciplines has grown over time, but similarly, so have the nation participants, okay? Now, what's very important to say is with an increase in nation participants, some of that has been politically based. The collapse of the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia being split up into certain countries has made, created more um, nations participating at the game. But what's very clear is that might not have an impact on all the athletes. So. There is a limit to the number of athletes country can send to a specific event. So you're only you're limited to three athletes. So the United States, they may have the eight best sprinters in the world, but you can only send three of them to participate in the 100 meters. So that is something you may wish to consider in your modeling. If you're looking at just general ELO ratings or however you want to look at things and saying, oh, that country has the best five or the best six athletes in the world, not all five or six will be going to that game for that specific event. And there's links between Olympic Games and politics, even though we don't want them to be. Obviously, in 1936, we had um, the Games of Nazi Germany, where Jesse Owens won his Olympic gold medals. And after the Cold War, we had this mass weaponization sports, okay, where the Soviet Union and the United States tried to demonstrate the dominance of their political regime, investing heavily in sports. Now, one thing to mention here is, is that there are some power sports at the Olympic Games, and these are the game, sports that gain the most media coverage, typically track and field and the gymnastics. So it's no surprise why the Soviet Union and the United States invested heavily in these two sports. However, one thing to consider is that a gold medal in the 100-meter final 
even though it's probably the most popular event at the Olympic Games, is worth the same as a hundred meters as a gold medal in the coxless pairs in rowing. So when you're making your predictions, try and avoid looking at the information about these popular sports and look at some of these less known sports because the weight of the gold medal is identical for both of them. So one thing about the medal table, and Jess alluded to this in the prediction, was that the International Olympic Committee say there is no ranking at the Olympic Games. If you go to Olympic website, at least your gold, silver, and bronze medals, but in alphabetical order. The medal tables are popularized by the media. And who wins the Olympic Games or tops the medal rostrum is the country that has the most gold medals. So you've got to think about it. A better strategy to perform well at the Olympic Games is to say, we're going to aim to win 30 events. We don't care if we're going to come last in all the other events because that should get us 30 gold medals and elevate us up the rankings. An inferior strategy would be to say, we're going to aim to get as many medals as possible. If we get a few bronzes, a few silvers, we might get 100 medals in total. 25 golds, 50 silver, and 25 bronze. That is not a good strategy to employ if you want to top the, the traditional medal tables. There are other ways to rank things, and these can give you an idea of who actually is successful at the games. So some places look at a Fibonacci sequence where a bronze medal is weighted one point, a silver medal is weighted two, and a gold medal is weighted three. And if I'm going to be doing some predictions, I would look at those aspects as well to help guide your decision-making process. But when it comes to making predictions, you want to ignore who's going to get that silver medal and who's going to get that bronze medal. You exclusively want to see who is the best. So if there's somebody who is an outside medal hope and they have a slow probability of maybe actually winning the gold medal, ignore them. You want to get the very best. That is what you're looking for in prediction. So that's the Tokyo 2020 medal table. And as Jess alluded to, Great Britain are in fourth position because they only have 22 gold medals. Japan are third with 27 gold medals, even though the total medals Team GB had at, at Tokyo Games was 64 compared to Japan's 58. So focus on the winners. So I'm going to move on to the determinants of success at the Olympic Games using the Sports Economics and Sport Management literature. And I'm going to give you an idea of some inputs and their importance or what I perceive to be the importance of those inputs, which you may then use for your own modeling. OK. I'm not going to go into the models used because I want you to be innovative with your methodologies. I'll give you an idea. So some people believe that um, winning a gold medal is a separate winning a medal is a separate process to how many medals you'll win. So it's a two stage process. So. Hurdle models are important. Some believe it's better to model this as a joint process. So if you win a medal and what color that medal is going to be, okay? I'm not gonna to go too much into that aspect because obviously we want you to be innovative with your methodologies. But the first main um, variable that is shown to impact success at Olympic games is population size. So larger countries often do better at the Olympic Games. So a country with a larger share of the world's population gets a larger share of the gold medals. And this is intuitive because if we assume a random distribution of athletic talent, and that is randomly distributed across the globe, if you have a greater distribution, if you have a greater population relative to other countries in, in, the, in the world, you're likely to have a greater share of top end athletes. And looking at China, China does seem to back up this claim because they are obviously very successful at the Olympic Games and they have a huge population. But we have caveats here. And the obvious caveat is India. India, if you go back, nowhere near the top 20 at the Olympic Games, yet they also have a huge population. So you may wish to be innovative and select better measures of population. In terms of athletes, when do athletes peak? I think we would say probably from the early to mid 20s to maybe their very early 30s. At the Olympic Games, we have athletes who may be slightly younger than in their early 20s, 
and particularly when we're looking at gymnastics and diving, because suppleness decreases as we age. We have athletes who are maybe in their teens. Tom Daly in 2008 was only 14 years old when he went to represent us in diving. And there are obviously other um, outliers where I believe it was the London 2012 Olympics. Um, there was a Japanese horse dressage contestant who was just in his late 70s or early 80s. I can't remember. But typically, would a better metric to look at Olympic success be those aged between, say, 14 and 35 or 16 to 35, whatever data is available? Will you get a better um, predictor than users just using the population in general? The next main input that is commonly used is income, GDP per capita or GDP. Okay. It is observed that richer countries perform better at the Olympic Games than poorer countries because they have more resources available to them to train their athletes. Okay. But also, income can exclude participation in certain sports. The key example here is sailing. To sail, you need to have a boat, which is very costly. Okay. Now, if you are priced out of buying a boat, even if you have a natural talent, so if nature has blessed you with talent as a sailor, it's going to be very difficult to nurture that talent as a sailor because you can't go out and practice. There's going to be an image showing the This was recently updated where the Team GB or the British government invested £27 million to invest in Manchester Velodrome. But those of you who are cyclists, you know how expensive it is to buy a top-end road bike to use them to train, okay, in a velodrome. So income may exclude participants from certain sports, but in my mind, I think it is overplayed because higher income or a country being richer doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be more spending on sports because governments have other priorities. They have to spend healthcare, they have to spend on education, transport infrastructure, and so forth. So if you can find specific metrics about spending in sport, that is better than looking at GDP in general. And my non-determinants Olympic success shows that GDP per capita is an insignificant determinant of Olympic success. Now, lo looking at politics, this is probably the main driver of success in one of my minds, okay? It's interlinked with spending on sport because if a government has a mentality that it wants to fund sport, there's been lots more finances available to it, and countries are going to do very well. And during the Cold War, spending on sport intensified. And if you look at former communist nations, they typically do better or outperform than they should at the Olympic Games. So most people model former communist nations with a dummy variable. One if you're a former communist nation, zero if you weren't. And typically, it's shown that that communist dummy is a highly significant and positively significantly determined to your Olympic success. But the effects of political ideology is waning. So there's a paper by Nolan and Starmer showing that how that has decreased over time since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So in your modeling, you may wish to potentially um, look at weighting this Soviet ideology through time. So diminishing that weight in terms of your predictions, if you're going to make a prediction. Okay. But policies, in my mind, are more important than political ideology. And there are there's a paper by Real de Boscher, which focuses on sport policies and which were the most effective at guaranteeing Olympic success. So I believe it's called SPLISS, S-P-L-I-S-S, -S, which is um, the policy papers that look at um, which policies guarantee or provide you a better return on your investment. Now, one of the best strategic investments in sport is actually by Team GB in cycling, okay? so. Team GB invested heavily in cycling after the Commonwealth Games in 2002, the construction of the velodrome and in the run to the London 2012 Olympics. And cycling is the reason why Team GP has propelled itself up its ranking and done so well since the Beijing Games of 2008. In addition, policies are also important for talent redistribution. So we all remember the film Cool Runnings where Jamaica had a bobsleigh team and they used sprinters. Well, Australia are very good at doing this as well. 
So they use sprinters for the luge at the Winter Games. But also, Australia, what they have found they've been doing is that they'll look at certain athletes in certain sports and say that, yes, you're an Australian rules football player. You are big, you are strong, you are tall. You've got a very strong vertical spring. In AFL, you might get so far. You should consider retraining as a high jumper because you will do far better in that sport than you will in AFL. So being able to redistribute talent is also important. And conjoined, this can actually really help you in your pursuit of Olympic success. So Team GB, one thing that they did, which is very intelligent, is they picked a specific sport that has many events at the Olympic Games. So cycling, the discipline or sport of cycling, has numerous events at the Olympic Games. So if you can be a front or a leader in cycling, you have more opportunities to get a gold medal than, let's just say, focusing at the marathon. So if you focus on the marathon, there's only one event there. And also, what Team GB did really well was, with cycling, there are transferable skills. If you're not going to be elite at cycling, but still very good, you can then move, maybe transition into the triathlon, which also offers more medal pumps. So in terms of modelling here, I would suggest that it's very interesting to look at countries and their policies and what sports and disciplines they have entered when it comes to making your predictions. So in a winter context, the Netherlands and speed skating. And finally, I'm going to talk about home advantage um, as another factor that's been shown as a very robust determinant of Olympic success. So horse in the Olympics, it will guarantee spending on sport because you need to build the facilities and infrastructure. Okay, and hosts of the Olympic Games often perform well at their own games. Japan finished third at their home Olympics. And prior to that, they were just roughly just flirting with the top 10. There's also an ex ante effect. So in the games prior to the ones they will host and also an ex post effect, in the games after you've hosted, you do very well at the Olympics. So you may wish in your modeling to really look at how Japan are going to do this year. How France will do this year, and I believe it's Melbourne in 2030. Oh, sorry, not 2030, no, LA 2028, and then Melbourne 2032. How those nations, Australia and the USA, will might perform with this X anti effects. So, why does home advantage matter? Well, one aspect is because of travel factors. It is said that athletes are well rested, they're not going to be succumb to jet lag at a home games. Now, I will say that the effect of home advantage has been declining, and that is due to maybe improved ways to travel. In the Melbourne Olympics in 1956, it was a 30-hour journey to get from Europe to Australia, and that did not include the multiple stop-offs you had. So I believe there were six stops to get from Europe all the way to Melbourne for the Games. Okay, As well, the 12-hour jet lag time difference Clearly, Australia would have had a greater far uh, home advantage in comparison to what um, the European athletes will have relative to the Australians now, where it's about a 14-hour direct flight from Australia to um, the Middle East, and from the Middle East, maybe a seven-hour flight to um, Europe and Paris. More importantly, with the um, athletics and sports being global now, most track and field athletes are already going to be in Europe prior to the events, okay? So there is, in the run-up to the Olympic Games, track and field athletes are currently in Monaco, participating in the Diamond League. Then they're going to be in London, and then they're going to go to Paris. So these travel factors are probably going to be very non-existent for most athletes in the run-up to these games. There's also the familiarity of conditions and race routes. So this is one of the things that might manifest with home advantage, where the local athletes know or uh, succumb to the climatic conditions. They also know the route of the race and where to maybe kick in a marathon or where, where maybe to um, not expend as much energy. And there's also crowd effects, in particular for subjective decisions. In sports, we make subjective decisions such as boxing or professional football. However, the effects of crowds, I believe, are not so strong as initially perceived. We saw in COVID, um, the bias for referees did not really change in terms of home advantage. And also, if we look at um, the Tokyo Games 
in Japan's performance, the Tokyo Games had an absence of crowds. So what is it with home advantage that matters? Who knows, but it seems to be very important. In my specific mind, I believe it's that mobilization of resources towards sport. And I'm going to give you one hint from me in terms of, persist um, terms of prediction. Persistence. This is quite simply the best predictor of success at the Olympic Games. Looking at past success and future success, okay? If you run a model, so I believe Jess showed a um, graph at the start showing a scatter plot of um, a 45 degree line and actual share and predicted medal share. If you include a lag dependent variable into that specification, I'm assuming, Jess, it was from my JSC paper. If it is, let me know. Um, but if you include a lag dependent variable into that, so it is, yes. So if you include a lag dependent variable into that graph, most points then become on, most points lie on that 45 degree line. Okay. So I will heavily recommend to look at the past if you're modeling future success. One of the problems of using look at persistence, it doesn't help address how nations break the cycle of not winning anything to winning something. And this persistence may be driven by the most successful nations at the games. So when you're doing your predictions, it might be worthwhile to remove those heavily successful nations, such as the USA and China, and see how much persistence explains. But you'll have a strong model fit, and I would certainly be tempted to look at that. And I am mindful for time. So I'm just going to go straight on to the conclusions and my predictions for 2024, which are those in bold. So it's going to be nicely circular to what I did before. So my gut feelings about doing any modeling, I had the USA to win, I had China second, and I had Team GB as third. When I used my statistical modeling, my model had USA top, China second, and France third. Okay? So we can see that if you compare the um, countries who are have hosted or the countries who have topped the Olympics and finished second, if you look at the last, say, four Olympiads, there was quite a lot of persistence there as well. Okay. Now, I've done number one. I've done number three from my introduction. What about number two and the bookmakers? Well, looking at other analysts and looking at some bookmakers, they too have the United States top, China second, and their statistical models are France third with GB fourth. Now, not that I'm encouraging people to gamble. But in my mind, they have got the United States as two strong favourites here. And China, maybe not. Um, I think the odds on China are worth a punt. If it was me, I'd say China about close to evens to top the medal table. And that's purely because of the way the rankings are done. OK, so randomness and um, decisions can really influence whether you finish a gold or get a silver medal. So it could be a case that a um, fraction of a second is a difference between winning a gold medal and a bronze medal. So if I was a betting man, I would possibly elevate China a little bit more close to the United States in this prediction competition. OK, but overall, I predict and the evidence seems to suggest that Team USA will win. And what I would like you to do just to finish off, I would like you to go back to the very first prediction you made on your piece of paper. And I wonder how many of you are going to revise that prediction based on some of the information you have now or whether you're going to stick with it. So I'm going to hand over to Jess and maybe she can add on a little bit to this and see how we finish off. So thank you very much for everyone's time. Um, I hope that was informed. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm trying to give you Zoom applause. Yes, lots of Zoom applause coming through. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I had China as mine. And I, I think I'm going to stick with it because, uh, like we say, that the point is about having an edge, isn't it, in a competition uh, and being different. Right. We're bang on time. So I'm just going to pop that link to the website in the chat. Um, I will give people um, a bit of time to ask any quick, like I said, we might have time for one or two quick questions. I'll just uh, give a, while well, we're waiting for those questions, so again, it can be for, for me as the organiser of the competition or uh, to our speaker. While waiting, I wondered if our sponsors just wanted to say a, a quick word uh, about anything 
just while we're waiting if, if anyone's got any questions. Hey everybody, can you hear me okay? Yep, got you, thank you. It's like a competition there between me and Milt to see which one would uh, move <laughs> first. Uh, no, just very, very happy to be involved this year. It's Melco's first year uh, sponsoring the competition and looking forward to the sports day overall. Uh, very, very insightful uh, demo there from Johan. So yeah, we're uh, super excited to be involved and don't envy the entrance in the competition. I think from a sports betting perspective, the, the bookmaker's perspective, which is the side of the fence that we're sitting on, it's uh, a difficult challenge, will we say? I think I referenced this on the previous webinar and um, being able to price accurately Olympic medal tables and Olympic events generally is much, much more difficult than the previous predictive competitions that the RSS have run. So, yeah, uh, exciting overall. Um, yeah, just happy to be involved from the Melco perspective. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, we have had a question in. Um, so, the question is about. Russia and how are they competing this year? Um, so I'll say from our perspective that the the way that we've done it, there's no Russian uh, nation in there and there's no none of these um, like Olympic committees or refugee. We haven't put any of those in. We've just gone with the, na the nations that are competing. And uh, as I say, if you go to the website, you'll see how the scoring is done. It, it doesn't matter if we'd have only asked you to do 50 of the countries, it still would it still would work. So Russia is being excluded, but I am going to throw that to Johan because that does make everything quite difficult when we're thinking about you going game by game or medal by medal. So Johan, any any if thoughts? I was going to be doing, if I was going to be doing predictions, I would probably include Russia as a nation in that because it's going to have an Olympic committee there. Now getting rid of Russia is going to make this more challenging. So I'd, um, I'd have... In, in the model, I'd keep Russia in there because they're going to be Olympic committees. And then the thing would be, see where they're going to, where they're going to finish. So you, you see Russia is going to win gold in shot put. And then you might have, it's going to be Greece who are going to get the silver medal. And then Lithuania get the bronze. And the prediction then, if you're excluding Russia from there, would be to elevate the silver to the gold and the bronze to the silver. And we look back. That's how I would probably approach that. One thing to mention, though, is that I believe Russia are not going to be broadcasting the games in the in Russia as a, their own kind of protest. So whether or not that means that they are kind of doing a LA Olympics boycott in the sense that they've not provided as much funding or support to the home athletes, who knows? So it might be that they potentially or even underperform. So it, it might just be a little bit annoyed in the background rather than as much as you've had beforehand. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's so interesting. Um, and then a similar question that, that we've had earlier is about when we're saying, when we're deciding who's won with that score, the, the answer is that it is when that Olympic flame is extinguished, that moment, it's your correlation with the medals table because, uh, and Johan again alluded to this, if in the future medals get taken off countries or so on, you would have still won the <laughs> RSS prediction competition uh, despite that. Right, that brings us perfectly almost to one hour from when we started. So I think I'll leave it there. But if anyone does have any questions uh, to the organisers, again, the website's in the chat and in the email that hopefully you've received for joining this webinar. So look there and our email address is also there if you want to email us questions. So just one final thank you and really a, a really big thank you from the RSS Statistics and Sports section for that fantastic talk. It was absolutely brilliant. Uh, tell us about your work and also relating that to the prediction competition in just the right balance that isn't going to make everybody do exactly the same thing. So really, thank you so much for that, uh, Johan. And yeah, thanks everyone for attending as well. Um, it's been it's been really great to see you all.